Okay, let's get going, everybody. Uh, it seems ages since we had a hashtag IFG Brexit event. Uh, but lots have been going on, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you to the Institute for Government here today. I'm Jill Rutter. I oversee our work on Brexit at IFG. Uh, when we pulled this together, we thought the interesting thing to discuss would be last week's European Council. Uh, we've now put that in the been there, done that, uh, nothing much happened box, but we're all riven with excitement, at least in the UK, about what is going to happen at the uh, Big Brother House tomorrow, aka the Prime Minister's Chequers Summit, where we had hoped Team Max Fac and Team New Customs Partnership would both be uh, showing experts where they come to in the cabinet version of The Apprentice. But it looks like instead we have a third way emerging that none of us quite understand yet, the uh, so-called Facilitated Customs Agreement, which is emerging. So it's all extremely exciting in the UK to see whether the UK cabinet can agree with itself where we go next on Brexit. But one of the things that we from the Institute have been trying to stress is that uh, it may be necessary to get agreement in the cabinet. It's certainly not sufficient because there are two sides to a negotiation and the other side are the EU 27. So this is our regular opportunity to catch up with how does Brexit seem to them, are they reporting, etc. So I'm joined by an absolutely terrific panel of people who will be watching events over the weekend on their country's behalf and reporting back if they can get the story in. So I am going to go from, we tried to do this east to west, but we've done sort of, you know, alliances or whatever. Uh, you can uh, tweet any metaphor you like for the way in which we've lined up the panel, but it was actually random. Uh, anyway, so on my far right, Jakob Krupa. Uh, Jakob is the UK correspondent for the Polish press agency since 2015, but those of you who follow him might also be aware that he is very, very interested in the fate of the million Poles who are currently enjoying living in the UK. So that is Jakob. Then next to him, Luigi Polito. Luigi is the London correspondent of Corriere della Sera. Uh, that's an Italian newspaper, for those of you who didn't like my mangled pronunciation. Um, so he was foreign editor from 2011 to 2017 and is now in London watching the uh, new Italian government, uh, potential from, new from allies in the UK. From a distance, <laughs> from a distance. And then immediately on my left, we have one of the sort of I think big journalistic, you know, emerging stars from Brexit. Uh, Tony Connolly, who has joined us from Brussels today, who is Europe editor for RTE. And if you want to compare and contrast with the UK's contingency planning for a leave vote, a book no one has written yet, I wonder why, with the Irish government's contingency pro, um, planning for a UK leave vote, can I recommend his book, Brexit in Ireland, The Dangers, the Opportunities and the Inside Story of the Irish Response, uh, which is a terrific read, published by Penguin in October 2017, but almost continually being updated, <laughs> so get yours from Amazon. And then I'm delighted to have Sonia Stolper, who has been around the UK for really rather a long time, for nine years, uh, for Liberation, third French, uh, largest da French daily newspaper, she co-authored Londres Out of the Box. Is it really cool that? Anyway, uh, I'm told that by Tim. Anyway, Londres Out of the Box. Uh, and obviously, we're all very interested in whether the real leadership of Europe is now in the hands of Monsieur le Président. I wouldn't dream of calling him Manu uh, Macron. Uh, or whether it is with our new panelists. Those of you who can count will note we have uh, brought in an extra panelist. Because having thought that Germany was too stark and stabil to bother with on this panel because all we get told is integrity of the single market, integrity of the single market, Frau Merkel, Frau Merkel, Frau Merkel. Suddenly Germany got interesting. So with Herr Seehofer on manoeuvres, so I'm delighted to be joined from Kirsten Leitl, who is the UK correspondent of Handelsblatt. Kirsten uh, has been here uh, for, uh, for a Year and a bit now? Two, two years? years? Two yeah. years, anyway. Right after the referendum. And for those of you that don't know, Handelsblatt, Handel is German for trade, so they're particularly interested in the way in which the 
uh, economic fallout uh, from Brexit is occurring. So that's our panel. So we're going to do it where I'm going to ask a couple of questions just to kick off, then we'll bring you in, then I've got some more questions. So it's all going to be quite rollicking in the next hour and a quarter. So think of your questions. If you are a civil servant, remember it is being live streamed. We can't edit you out if you make your views known on any emerging options. So bear that in mind and think about how you phrase your phrase. There are enough former civil servants in the audience that they can probably ask the difficult questions for you. So we're all, as I've just said, we're all getting terribly excited about what's going to happen. Um, so are you reporting it? I mean, how is this going down? What to, are you getting onto the front page with Checkers Away Days? Jakob? Well, I think the simple answer is no. Uh, <laughs> of course, we'll be reporting on that, but when I spoke with my editors about the event and, and, and why I think it's important to cover that, they're like, yeah, great, Let, send us an email afterwards and tell us what happens. And so trying to explain them that this is you know, the big Love Island thing that everyone's going to be excited about, they did not really understand that at the start. So I think there is growing confusion in, in, the, in the Polish media and in the Polish politics about the fact that we, it's been you know, so many months since the referendum, we still don't know what the UK wants. And I think it's not more about checkers as such, it's about let's wait for something, that something the moment that will come, we'll finally know what the UK wants and then we can go on with that. I'm not sure if the checkers or the white paper, if there's a sort of single event that the big hopes of Poland are on, I think it's more about finally lit hearing what's the, what's the big thing. The internal disputes of UK government, as much as frustrating they are for Polish and other European mm -hmm. negotiators, are not that fascinating for the general public, I think. And it's kind of difficult to explain as well, whenever we write for the, for the, for the readership in Poland or the polls in the UK, and they're sort of trying to understand you know, so much time um, after the referendum, why the UK still doesn't know what they want, how, how does it work, why, why is this such a complicated process? And I think everyone struggles to understand that in a way. And this will be the key question after checkers, if there's a clear vision or strategy or direction of travel. But then again, the people I spoke with in the Polish yeah. government in preparation for the event today, they are not massively hopeful about that. So, so we'll see where, where we go and we'll see where we're going to be on Saturday or, or, or Sunday after the meeting, but no big hopes in Poland at the moment. So is anyone doing checkers previews? Tony, you must be doing some checkers previews. Uh, I would be, but I'm here. Yeah, oh. so, uh, <laughs> so the I, Irish I don't know what to yeah, think. Yeah, no, I'll be going back to Brussels tomorrow. Um, yeah, well, we, we, we did a podcast, uh, which will go out tomorrow, actually. We, we have a new RT Brexit podcast, uh, so it, it will try and look ahead to checkers without being suddenly dated by events and checkers. But I mean, yeah, the, the Irish uh, watching and listening public have grown accustomed to being uh, very tuned in to Brexit, although at the moment uh, we find that weather is a, is a bigger uh, ratings uh, earner than Brexit. Uh, that's with the heat wave and also uh, the, the snows back in, in February. But um, uh, in terms of the Irish government, yeah, they're watching very closely to see what comes out of Chequers. It, the current climate in Westminster was described to me by an Irish official as uh, political Wimbledon, uh, and that wasn't a compliment, by the way. Um, the Irish are still waiting uh, to see what Britain brings forward on, on the backstop. That's the kind of uh, clear and present issue for the Irish government and, and, the, and the population as well. Will, will there be a backstop? Will it be legally operable, as, as the jargon goes? And uh, you know anything within the Chequers uh, event that provides any signals or clues to that will be watched very closely. But I think, obviously, Chequers is about the white paper, which is really about the future uh, relationship rather than the withdrawal agreement. And the withdrawal agreement is where the backstop has to sit. Uh, so while the British government see both as, as very um, intrinsically linked, um, I don't think uh, Dublin is expecting any major breakthroughs because I think, to be honest, all of this is so subterranean uh, in terms of how Theresa May is managing uh, this issue. Uh, the interplay between her and a tight group of officials and the rest of the cabinet and, and Brexiteers and so on, um, that, that is a long-term thing that is inching forward uh, and, and will take a lot more inching forward before we get any real clarity. So Kirsten, we have uh, Mrs May, we, as we speak, should be talking, maybe even lunching with Chancellor Merkel, 
who is obviously looked more fragile this week than for for some time, and they're giving a joint press conference at uh, at two o'clock. What actually you know, might the Prime Minister get out of that? Obviously, she's trying, if you read the British press, to ensure that whatever comes out next week isn't dead on arrival and immediately rejected by the EU. Is she going to get a sympathetic hearing in Berlin or not well, so I, likely? I, I think um, the Germans are very sympathetic to the uh, UK, but the point is um, the UK has to come up with a position and a position that is uh, agreed from the whole cabinet. And uh, so I think that, uh, in a way, um, Germany is following the Brexit debate quite closely, of course, due to the economic ties we have. And, uh, but it always depends who you're talking to, how important Brexit nowadays still is. If you're talking to a politician, he'd say, yes, well, we do have China, we have uh, Trump, and we have uh, Seehofer, mm. our interior minister, who has been uh, quite a, um, yeah, has, uh, uh, hmm? <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that, but he, he did, um, he appeared in the newspapers more often recently than uh, previously. And uh, then we might have, have Brexit on, on the agenda. And if you talk to business people, it's the same. They are fearing trade wars mm. with China and, and the US. And so there are many, many topics on the agenda. And Brexit is just, just is not another top five. So if, you're, if you're German, though, and you're worried about trade wars, if the Prime Minister really does offer something like the single market on goods, incredibly good news for the rest of Europe, you could argue, given that we love buying European goods uh, and basically doesn't ask for reciprocal special treatment on services where we're relatively good at supplying. Isn't that just a sort of gift that actually it's just worth pocketing and moving on with all this trumpery and chinery and stuff like that? Wouldn't well, France think, or Germany see it that way? I Kirsten think... Uh, Angela Merkel has made it really clear that the negotiations are being uh, done in, in Brussels and not in Germany. So, um, of course, we would like to move on and we would like to have a solution to the whole Brexit debate and everything. But it's not up to the Germans to offer like real deals or whatever that is Michel Barnier's um, uh, question. So, um, yes, we'd like to find a solution. And I think um, Angela Merkel has made it quite clear in February that she's not frustrated with Brexit, but she is still expecting what the UK really wants. And maybe the Theresa May can give now a clear hint what is happening. But um, having said that, I mean, we have the meeting in Chequers where it's still open what the outcome will be there. So, yeah. Sonia, what would, uh, what would it take to come out of Chequers? and the white paper next week well, for it actually uh, to cut through in France and get you maybe not onto the front page, but on page three? I have three. to say I tried very strongly to get on the front page. I actually recommended four pages on Brexit and I told them that it was the Crunch Talk Summit and that was the moment we needed to talk about. And they said yes, but no. <laughs> and um, so it finalised with two pages yesterday and then this morning I had just one page. Uh, the thing is, you have that feeling that it has happened already. We've had th those crunch talks in Chequers or anywhere else telling us it's coming now and we're going to have a solution or something. It's actually not even a plan, but a plan which is workable and we, to which the European Commission could answer back. And f until now, everything which has been put forward, or not everything, but quite a lot, has been seen as either frankly unworkable or frankly fantasist. Mm. So now you need to see what comes out of tomorrow, of course. We might have a, a great surprise. Personally, I doubt it very much because I've been writing quite a lot about uh, those uh, showdowns. Mm -hmm. showdowns and it's coming but actually it's not coming so I do understand uh, why my chief editor wasn't that excited mm -hmm. and as well it is very complex and it is, it is still that feeling that Britain two years on is still talking to itself and not really to um, the mm -hmm. Europeans and on the question of the four freedoms and the offer of, of freedom on the good I think the, there is a huge misunderstanding in the fact that for Europe right now, those f four freedoms are inscribed in the Foundation Treaty of 1957. It is basically on, on what European Union is funded. And right now, European Union has lots of other problems mm. than just Brexit, as Kirsten was rightly saying. So just for Britain 
changing those rules mm -hmm. and that treaty would mean actually weakening again even more the EU, EU. And I don't think there is any appetite for that. So Luigi, I mean, the new Italian government, um, mm -hmm. more Eurosceptic than Definitely. any Italian government we've seen. Uh, Signor Salvini has been, if he's the mover and shaker in it all, has been making quite sympathetic sounds about the, the UK. So should the UK be looking to Italy as a potential new ally mm. in those talks? That'll be a bit where the dynamic has changed. Well, potentially, yes, because, I mean, just remember the association between Mr. Grillo and Mr. Farage, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the, how the Five Star Movement yeah. was sympathetic towards the, the Brexit. And, uh, of course, I mean, I think that the new Italian government, especially Salvini, would be very happy to do something, you know, to disrupt the Franco-German Europe. So if he can offer, how to say, uh, uh, something to the British, mm. I think it would be very happy, happy to, uh, you know, to see a development that goes towards a more, uh, a Europe more focused on the national sovereignty, mm. sovereignty of each mm. country, more than a federal Europe. So in this sense, yes, the new Italian government could be, um, I don't want to say an ally, but definitely could be sympathetic to the demands that come from London. And Jakob, the Polish government, or have they got bigger fish to fry with standoffs no, I mean, over other things? Are they all <laughs> other having, allies? Sorry, yeah. Having said that, yeah. Brexit is definitely off the radar at the moment. <laughs> I mean, they are, they are not focusing on that. The, the, the pre pressing issues are completely yeah. different. The migrant issue, and this is what is destabilizing mm. European mm. politics. So in this context, actually, Brexit is probably a, you know, a nuisance, a mm. sideshow, a, at the moment not really relevant. So what I was saying yeah. before was, you know, in, per, in perspective, but at the moment they are not really thinking about Brexit or Britain or, or this okay. kind of development. Down the so. in trade. <laughs> what, about, what about the Poles? I mean, the, the Polish government obviously very clearly sees itself as a natural ally of the UK. The, the, the Conservatives sit, sit together with the Polish ruling party in the European Parliament. There's so much similarities between mm. them in, in the way they look at Europe. However, again, the general consensus within the Polish government is despite the, the clashes they continuously have with the mm. European Commission and the uh, rule of law and other issues, mm. the, the very clear answer from also is the negotiations are being conducted by Brussels. It's not up to us. Poland has its own interest in the negotiations, mm. definitely yes, particularly when it comes to security, uh, partially because of the UK's mm. presence in, the, in Poland and uh, you know, joint interest in terms of Russia, uh, particularly about the UK, mm. uh, Polish nationals in the UK. So there are these areas where Polish government is really interested and really keen to have discussed that with the UK government. But in general, very clearly, the signal message from Warsaw is again, it's Barnier, it's not us, talk to them first. There will be moment, I guess, and I think in that sense the what some Brexiteers claim is true, that there will be moment in the autumn at some point that there will be a political space for some mm. adjustments in the deal. Mm. There will be moment when the political aspect of negotiations mm. will kick in, when the leaders will be saying, why don't we just do something differently? We, we are running out of time, let's change something. However, it's not there yet. And to get to that point first, we need to have a clear position from the UK saying that's what we want so that the technical discussions can get to a point in which we can then discuss how we can change it or adjust at, at the very end of it. Uh, in general, uh, definitely Polish government mm. is keen to work mm. with the UK. Just think about the massive trade surplus mm. that Poland has with the UK, for example, um, on a number of mm. industries. So it, it would be difficult for Poland if there's no deal or if the, ba of, if the deal is bad. However, again, negotiations are being conducted by Brussels. Even though Poland openly talks about itself as the bridge on which the UK will go to the other side. And I know that Poland has been sympathetic in the negotiations in the EU27. However, there's a limit to that. If I can add something, yeah. I remembered yeah. a, a potential major clash between the current Italian government and UK could be the attitude towards Russia. Because, I mean, you probably do not entirely realize how uh, friends of Russia they are, especially Mr. Salvini, also the Five Star Movement. I mean, they have organic links with the Russian structure of power, probably also financial links, whatever. And so on this issue where UK is at the forefront of a, how to say, more uh, firm stand towards Russia, here there could be the biggest divergence between the two countries. So Sonia and Kirsten, 
If the UK is seen to be allying with Poland and Italy, who are quite sort of difficult members of the uh, Club of the 27 at the moment, is that helpful for the UK or is that likely to provoke a bit of a sort of battening down the hatches among the sort of... Uh, yeah, well, Franco-German axis. I think it would be interesting to see if they really follow through with their their tendencies to have closer mm. uh, ties mm. with the UK and if that um, strategy really works out. I mean, we have seen in the beginning of the negotiations, of the Brexit negotiations, that um, the, the UK government has had the hopes to um, split up the group mm. of the 27 EU countries and they haven't succeeded so far. So um, I would be a little bit sceptic if these tactics really work out in the end and if, um, as you uh, say, push comes to shove, um, if it really is such a close alliance, um, Ita Italy, uh, UK and Poland achieve. So I I'd be cautious. I mean, we have seen so many twists and turns in these Brexit negotiations mm. and um, the bottom line is it, it wasn't successful to find allies, mm. um, but the EU has kept quite close together and I don't see that this is changing so so Sonia I'm yeah. afraid I have to agree with my <laughs> German ally <laughs> but the <That's> good <laughs> <laughs> no but the fact is I mean the recent past yeah. has shown that whatever difficulties in the end, the EU unity prevails. I mean, we've seen that in the Euro crisis. We've, been, we've seen that, and right now there are much, I mean, much bigger issues than Brexit. You have Trump, mm. you have Russia, you have Iran, you have uh, Middle East. I mean, you have quite a lot of big, big problems mm. right now, and it's been very clear that actually Europe managed to work together united against, we've seen that for the climate, we've seen that for the Iran, uh, I mean with the UK actually, uh, with the Iran deal. Um, so I think you can try to divide but in the end there is still very much the feeling that if you're stronger united, so, specifically yeah. in those geopolitical uh, um, times. So Tony, the one country for whom Brexit is bigger than Trump or Russia or whatever, it's clearly, clearly Ireland. Uh, if people are saying that the prospects of no deal are rising, your book interestingly documents the sort of Irish government having to make a choice between did it actually try to go bilaterally with the UK, use those historic links to actually find workable solutions, or did it throw its lot in totally with the 27? It decided to throw its lot in with the 27 but if the prospect of no deal rises ireland really really is on the sort of front line of problems for for no deal if the eu decides that integrity of the single market is everything and uh go hang uk or whatever just wonder if you could give us a bit of a sense mr varadka made some quite interesting comments about what would ireland do in the event of no deal and the hard border so where's current thinking in in the Republic about where things are getting to on no deal? Yeah, I mean, the, the orthodoxy for the Irish government has been that they're not accepting a hard border uh, and, and that's the end of it. So when you put the question of no deal to Irish ministers or spokespeople, they'll, they'll, they will talk about east-west uh, implications. They, they are making plans uh, in ports and airports, but th the, the official line is they're not making any plans for north-south because they're they're relying on on the promises of uh, the London government that there will be no infrastructure or checks on the border uh, so therefore they're not making contingency plans now obviously they must be <laughs> somewhere in, in in the background but um, it it kind of has been their stock and trade to say that we're not discussing technical solutions. We're not discussing uh, any, um, you know, preparations for a hard border because that uh, that that takes it out of the political. Um, and and in a sense, there there is a it's a bit of a risk, I think, for the Irish government. Uh, and they have or they are relying on what they see as a promise, uh, an unconditional promise by the British government not to have any checks on the border. Um, now, they would see that promise as residing in the joint report from last mm. December. Um, I put this to uh, Sir Tim Barrow, the uh, UK ambassador, at a briefing uh, last Friday. 
is that his understanding of where this promise lies? And he said, no, it, the, uh, the UK government's promise uh, and commitment is only to the Good Friday Agreement uh, in, mm. in terms of it being unconditional. Mm. So you can see there's a subtle difference, or maybe a not so subtle mm. difference in how they, both London and Dublin, interpret this. Um, but I think in general, the Irish government is going to start feeling more heat from the different sectors if it looks like a no deal scenario is about to land on everybody. Mm. Um, because of course they have front loaded their uh, diplomatic strategy uh, on Northern mm. Ireland and, and the border mm. issue, whereas of course the bilateral trade east and west mm. is like in bread and butter mm. uh, economic terms so much bigger. But it's quite interesting, if the UK government says, and we've heard this from people saying, under no circumstances will the UK put in border controls at the hard border, and we'll let things that meet EU regulatory standards, we you know, won't assume that Irish cows that were okay to go north you know, today are okay to go north on the 30th of March 2019. But if the EU then comes in and says, but those Northern Irish pigs, can't, I can't remember which way the flows go, uh, those Northern Irish pigs can't come south because those are not single market pigs anymore. Mm -hmm. Will the Irish government actually bend to pressure from the 27 to put in border inspection posts along there with the UK saying, we're not the ones tearing up the Good Friday Agreement, it's you guys tearing up the Good Friday Agreement. Well, that, that's, that's the big question. If there's no deal, uh, what happens? Um, and, and that's why we've been asking the Irish government uh, and the British government recently what, what, what happens at the border if there's no deal. Um, the Irish, of course, say that there won't be any infrastructure because the UK has promised that there won't be. Um, and, and the Irish government see the logic of that promise as making sure that that, that promise implies compliance with the mm. EU uh, rulebook. But the EU hasn't promised there won't be any infrastructure. No, the, I mean, the EU has promised through the negotiating guidelines that uh, imaginative and flexible solutions will be required. Uh, and that's the, that's the kind of DNA of this process, that, that a solution will have to be found. Now, obviously, if there's no deal, then in a sense, everything is out the window. Um, would, would the UK then facilitate no checks uh, and leave the UK single market wide open uh, on the Irish border? Um, and what would that mean for the future relations between the EU and the UK? It's a big question. It's hard, it's hard to know the answer at this stage. Okay, right. I'm going to stop asking questions because I know I'm sort of frustrated everybody in the audience. There are mics circulating. Uh, so who would like to ask questions? You're supposed to ask a woman first, actually, apparently, but okay. So if anyone wants to ask a question, please do. If not, I'm going to go for uh, Adela David here. So let's take a little cropette of questions and hopefully we'll have more. So, David. David Hennick, David Hennick from the European Centre for International Political Economy, a trade policy think tank. Just wondering for the correspondents based in London, whether they could comment on how they think uh, the UK politicians view, view Europe and whether the, oh. you actually think that UK politicians and the government actually understand how Europe, Europe works and negotiates. No. <laughs> <laughs> hold back, hold back, Luigi. You've got time to think about that one. Yes, there. Uh, Vernon Bogdan or King's College London. My, my question really follows from that. And we've heard that the EU is a rule-governed association, and the rule so far is you only get frictionless trade if you're prepared to accept free movement and the other things that Norway, for example, has accepted. And if that's the case, there's not really very much to negotiate about. You say what obligations you're prepared to accept, and you read off the benefits. Well, we've also heard a good bit about Franco-German Europe. Now, Franco-German Europe is really liberal Europe, led at the moment by President Macron, and that faces an existential crisis at the moment. So it's not just Britain that's hmm. in a crisis, it's also the EU. And the question really is uh, whether there's a conflict between the rule-governed Europe and a liberal Europe, because we are, we may not seem like it sometimes, but we are also part of liberal Europe, and if and when we leave, liberal Europe will be greatly weakened. And it's a question of whether there's not a conflict between a very rigid interpretation of EU rules and the preservation of liberal Europe. And someone once said yeah. that rules are made for the guidance of wise yeah. people and the blind obedience of fools. 
Okay, we were just debating what would happen in negotiations were run by algorithms uh, upstairs, but anyway, uh, and see where you would get to the solution. Yes. Hi, Sam Arvis from the EU Policy Team at the Wellcome Trust. We're a global health funder. Mm -hmm. um, Given some of us are waiting for the UK government's response on certain issues as fervently as in the mm. EU and the restrictiveness of the Article 50 task force, how do we raise issues that are really important um, for EU, U, EU, UK collaboration, things like clinical trials or scientific research? Who do we speak to and get that on the agenda? In the EU. In the EU. In the EU. Okay, let's go to that first. So, um, so who, do we understand Europe? Does the UK political class understand Europe. We've had a, a no from Luigi. Do you want to expand no, no, on that? No, 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 yes, because it's, I mean, the, the two questions yeah. complement each yeah. other because mm. actually that's the point. I mean, Europe is uh, fundamentally a legal construction. So uh, it's bent to preserve this legal construction, to preserve itself, right? So uh, this is the reason for the a tough approach by Mr. Bernier. I mean, if you take off one element of this legal construction, the risk is that you will have the whole construction crumble. <coughs> so the more, how to say, the, the, the appeal from the uh, British government to have a more constructive, pragmatic, creative approach in, will inevitably clash with the fact that the Europeans, they first they set mm. the general principles and then they derive the consequences mm -hmm. from that and it's all how to say it's a Cartesian approach <laughs> more than a, a pragmatic approach but the point about yeah. the uh, divorce mm -hmm. between liberal Europe and, mm -hmm. uh, and and the, the legal the liberal Europe and the legal mm -hmm. construction this is a very good point because mm -hmm. actually I agree that liberal Europe is in danger is under threat and Britain is a bulwark of liberalism in this continent and I'm afraid we Europeans should not be left alone with ourselves because, we, we, sure be, because, because, that, we, because we could do damage, I'm afraid, as we have done in the past. So how's it seen from uh, seen in Germany and France? Well, I, I do agree to a certain uh, extent because I think uh, this is absolutely true and that is the reason why Germans are particularly so sad about Brexit. I mean, uh, I think it is absolutely clear that Germany doesn't want the UK to leave the EU and uh, I would absolutely agree that this is one of the big um, challenges the EU faces now that um, the UK is leaving and we have to reorganize and reshuffle all the whole position. This is one of the big challenges we're facing now, yes, and that's exactly why we didn't want you to leave. <laughs> but if you're looking at things like, say you're looking at, uh, at security as a sort of just a thing, the Prime Minister went to Munich, she made, you know, quite a sort of open and generous offer on security cooperation, seems very keen to do that. I mean, does that all fall to bits, basically, because the UK can't get a data adequacy decision and things like that? I mean, you know, how far do people see the future relationship in the wider political context rather than you actually have to tick box by box by box and then you're allowed in, which I think, you know, part of that, you know, should there not be a greater sense of the uh, European objective of keeping the UK close and part of the family rather than driving us into Empire 2.0, Kanzak, Trump alliances or whatever? Well, I, I think it's, uh, we've talk a, talked a lot mm. about cherry picking and mm. all this and it is true that it's in no one's interest that uh, we go separate ways and, and don't talk to each other and, and try to have a muddy uh, divorce. Mm. But in the end, uh, there are certain rules to be followed and in the end, we have to uh, look where it's possible to have a close cooperation and where not. And I, th I do think there are uh, bits and pieces where like if you take Galileo, for example, mm. it is quite difficult to see how that should work if the, EU, uh, if the UK is a third country. And uh, it's, it's not about goodwill, it's about the practicality of these things. It is simply, if you decide to, to leave, you have to consider the bad consequences as well. So I don't think it's, it's about pragmatism, it's simply rules. So. So, rules get in the way of the sort of ends, no, is I that really what... I think we have to, to, to remember that 
uh, it is the UK mm. who has decided to leave the EU. It's not the EU pushing mm. away the UK. And I don't think any government right now in the 27 mm. wishes the uh, Brexit to happen. And if ever the government would decide to retrieve Article 50 and say, after all, we're staying because it's so big a mess that let's try to talk together and work again together, I'm pretty sure everyone will say, fine. Actually, we can write mm. lots of mm. pages on that, but page so, one. so <laughs> front page. <Yeah. laughs> but uh, but the fact is, uh, for your question about uh, do the British politician uh, know or understand how Europe uh, works, I really think no. That mm. the answer is no, clearly not. And uh, I blame for that probably 20 years of complete disinterest into Europe affairs, apart from the one who were really into the, in the heart of what was going on, and, and on education. Because clearly today there are sometimes um, real misunderstanding that you think they shouldn't have, because they should know a bit better how it works. And finally, um, one thing about bending the rules and being a bit more uh, mm. flexible and everything, I'm, I'm pretty sh I mean, I'm sure once there is a base of workable discussions, mm. there will be some rules which will be, of course, uh, bended. And clearly, mm. in terms of security, mm. that will be true. But for example, to go back to uh, the Galileo story, the Galileo project, the UK has been very much into the conception of it, but right at the beginning, they were very much against it. And then they were very, very much against the GPS, because they wanted to preserve their American uh, links and the GPS was enough. And then when Galileo was launched, they participated, but they were the one as well resisting first the encrypt security bit of it and who put and who insisted on put the lines about a third country not being allowed to use it. So now that they're leaving, they're saying, well, actually, we put on that rule, but for us, because we are quite special, which is true, because we're the first to leave, we are the size of our economy, the size of our security links and, and everything, our weight, which is perfectly true, is so important that actually just for us, you should bend the rules. But the problem is, if we do that, then what happens for the others behind who will say, well, I'm important mm. as well, and I want to bend the rules on that or that or that. And it's already quite difficult mm. to get together 28 mm. country decide something. Mm. Uh, if we begin like that. If I can say so something on, on the security cooperation, I know Theresa May raised that issue when she addressed EU leaders last mm. Thursday night. Um, but when, when you come to the detail of, of sharing information, the Schengen information system allows a, an Irish policeman mm. to go straight into the database of the Belgian police. Mm. He doesn't need a warrant, he doesn't need, he or she doesn't need a warrant or a judge, mm. he just goes straight into the database. Uh, and at the same time, the UK has been notorious for wanting to uh, access and utilize the information in other European databases, but being very frugal uh, themselves with information. But the reason that uh, this system works is that you have a set of rules that, that give the Belgian authorities confidence that that information will not be abused by the Irish authorities. And to paraphrase a senior uh, EU official on the task force, uh, when the UK says, well, you have to trust us, the point is that uh, EU member states do trust each other, but it's not spontaneous trust. It's trust because it's underwritten by shared institutions, yeah. by the rule of law, by arbitration, by monitoring in the European Court of Justice. So, Tony, I was going to come back to you with this question from a friend from the Wellcome Trust about, actually, you know, there's a lot of uh, bodies in the UK, businesses, you know, universities, scientific organisations, who all have a big vested interest in actually things working out relatively well after. Um, are they getting any sort of hearing? How should they, cause should they be engaging directly with Task Force 50, with the Parliament? Where are their, where are their sort of entry points into the EU system? If they, uh, obviously they're lobbying the British government, but maybe the bandwidth's a bit narrow mm -hmm. there. So where should they be doing? And do you see anyone doing that particularly well from your Brussels standpoint? Well, I think they will have to go through the British government because the future 
framework relationship between the UK and the EU mm. will, will govern all of that stuff and mm. whether or not the UK still has access to Horizon 2020 and, and the framework mm. programs, that will depend on uh, what deal is reached mm. at the end. Now, everyone assumes that the UK will stay in Horizon 2020, but they will pay mm. for, for that access uh, because they have been so successful. Mm. I mean, the, the, the UK has got more mm. out of Horizon 2020 than any other. Uh, it has put more mm. money in and got more mm. money back out. And now from a selfish mm. Irish point of view, a lot of <laughs> Irish universities are uh, trying to poach um, UK scientists from Cambridge and Oxford mm -hmm. and so on to, to get them over to mm -hmm. Trinity or, or mm -hmm. UCD or whatever uh, so that they can create these mm -hmm. collaborations yet still mm -hmm. be part of uh, Horizon 2020 funding. I just wondered, one of the propositions, and it goes a bit to this, that the Prime Minister had in her Mansion House speech was that the UK would stay part of some of, or still have a relationship or be under the jurisdiction of, um, the, some of the European agencies. So we had the Aviation Safety Agency, we had the Medicines Agency and the Chemicals Agency. Anyone, seen anyone on their side sort of saying, yeah, that makes a whole bunch of sense. Doesn't make sense to have separate drugs markets in Europe. You know, it makes sense for the UK to still be doing what it is. Okay, they've lost the EMA headquarters. We've, you know, collected that. Not everybody obviously won out in that uh, interesting competition, but, um, is there a sort of appetite for continued UK adherence to some of those agencies, or is that too fine print and UK's not put out anything substantial enough? Well, I think, um, especially in the case of EMA, um, mm. the European Medical Agency, it would be very important to cooperate. Mm. Um, it doesn't really make sense whenever you talk to someone from the industry, from pharmaceutical companies or from mm. hospital, it, the whole um, uh, situation, the whole um, uh, relationship is so intertwined mm. that it's really bad to separate it. But um, uh, I, I would agree it's too uh, early to talk about these things if we haven't even heard about the uh, general white paper and, and all the other parts of the negotiation. Tony, how did that part go down in Brussels, that part of the speech? Um, well, again, it, it, you, you always come back to this issue uh, of what the UK would be prepared to accept in order to access these agencies yeah. and, and to be members of it. And when you say it makes perfect mm. sense for, for, mm. for not fragmenting stuff, mm. the repost is always, well, the EU <laughs> therefore makes perfect sense because that's why it was created to, to have these uh, common agencies. Um, I mean, I think they will have to pay to access them and they will, they will have to abide by the European Court of Justice. Um, I mean, I think all of these, mm. you see, the, I think at a wider level, the battle in the cabinet, which we're going to see played out tomorrow, is about how close the UK remains within the EU's orbit. And if, if I read the signals correctly and I read between the lines, then Theresa May has taken a fairly major strategic decision, perhaps back at, in December, to, to pull the UK away from the Canada style trade agreement and closer to the Norway style mm. agreement where they are in mm. all of these agencies and pay for the privilege and submit to the uh, the, the remit of the European mm. Court of Justice. She just hasn't been able to do that publicly and she mm. hasn't been able to bring her cabinet with her. Uh, mm. But I, I think that that's mm. the direction of travel. It's a boiling frog strategy as I think one of our journalists. So Jakob, if the Prime Minister brings people over the line on single market for goods, facilitated customs, partnership, arrangement, whatever mix of initials we get for some new customs thing that will deliver sort of frictionless borders, solves Tony and uh, Mr. Riker's problems in Ireland or whatever, but says the one no-go area is freedom of movement. Mm -hmm. That was the one message we got out of the referendum is that freedom of movement has to stop, yeah. has to stop. How does the Polish government react to that. Uh, well, that's a tricky one because obviously Poles um, have formed so the biggest constituency of EU nationals in the UK, over one million Poles in the UK at the moment. The thing is that the Polish government here has sort of conflicting interests in a way because at the same time they want to safeguard the future in the UK, mm -hmm. so therefore they're pushing for guarantees of, the, of further future rights in the UK, pushing for the mm -hmm. settled status system to be as simple as possible, we're still mm -hmm. to see if that's going to mm -hmm. be the case. 
But at the same time, obviously, the Polish government and I think the Prime Minister was on the record saying that a number of times. They're hoping that the, the whole Brexit chaos around that will, will make some people think, like, when don't we go back to Poland? Um, so I Poles think, are coming home. So I think in that sense, slogan. there is a sort of weird sense of two ideas conflicting within the Polish government about we need to do whatever we can to protect the future mm. in the UK, but also if some of them think to sort of realise it's kind of difficult and they go back, that's not the worst thing possibly ever. But if, very quickly, if I may mm. come back to the, uh, to the question gentlemen ask you about the UK mm. politicians and mm. the way they understand mm. Europe, because I think, uh, and you would see that from reactions of pretty much all of us, when a few days ago someone posted information that the white paper will be apparently translated into 23 European languages. Now, that's Straight for, I mean, straight away, that's insulting. I mean, that's so the idea of the European politicians not reading in English and not being able to comprehend that unless it's written in Polish, Lithuanian, Czech, Slovak, German, or, or French is just insulting for European leaders. And that's the way they, they will look at it if that happens because mm. there's very clear sense that they do understand English, they do know what's in the paper, and the lack of the content will not be covered by the fact that it's written in Polish. Uh, so that definitely doesn't help. And we've seen that very, a number of times before. I mean, when you look back to the Lancaster, uh, Lancaster House speech, for example, it was very, very striking that from the moment the Prime Minister ended her speech, all the, all the UK lobby was like, oh, great speech, that, that vision for future relationship. And all the Europeans were like, she's threatening us. Literally, that was the reaction within the people who, of the people who were in the room. The European reaction was, she's threatening us with walking out of the negotiations, threatening us on security and defence cooperation. This is not a good speech. And I think this is a recurring theme throughout the negotiations, that there's clearly lack of someone who knows Europe better, who has experience of living or working in Europe or with Europeans, or who indeed, people who are Europeans, okay. who, who at some point yeah. just advise, look, yeah. there's sensitivities that you need to take but care of. it goes of. back to yeah. the fact that Theresa May has been speaking mainly towards her own cabinet yeah. and her own yeah. conservative yeah. party and not to Europe. Yeah, yeah no, this is the problem. I mean, the, the, the discussion about Brexit, the debate is completely insular in this country and it doesn't take into account what comes from Europe. And there's this always great yeah. surprise that people in Europe yes. listen to the speeches. Like, they actually listen to the speeches. How does that work? So you've just told us that you don't actually get very much reporting of them anymore, though, Jakob. So maybe, maybe we have segmented those audiences quite successfully through a bit of Brexit fatigue. But if anyone in Dexu is watching down the live stream, there was a saving suggestion. No, we love our friends. They're great. They're really helpful. But they may be really helpful, but I mean, they don't have to spend their weekend translating or putting the document into Google no. Translate yeah. or quite however we were going to do it. I think you've just saved yourselves a lot of potential fun <laughs> of reading a rapidly translated document into 23 languages. Let's go to some more questions. So we have Adela down here. Lewis, and then we'll go over there. Uh, <coughs> Robin Butler, House of Lords. I'd just like to get the panel's opinions on the likely future course of the negotiations. It's a common refrain that uh, the EU can't negotiate to, with Britain because Britain hasn't said clearly what it wants. Now, on the assumption that a white paper is produced, however reluctantly and with what difficulty <laughs> over the, uh, this weekend, I imagine that the EU negotiators are not simply going to say this is totally unacceptable and break the negotiations at that point. So will that white paper at least now set the agenda for the future negotiations? Okay, yes and then. Uh, thank you very much. Okay. Um, Mark Sommerfeld from the Renewable Energy Association. Um, my question is really about your audiences who you're reporting to in your domestic markets um, and the level of the debate that is happening there. But from what you've said, because of everything else going on in Europe, it suggests that it's a fairly passive audience on the Brexit issue. There's not much public debate going on. Is that the case or is there more public debate happening within your domestic countries informing what saying what Britain should be doing, what the EU should be doing, and what your domestic government should be doing. The purpose of that question being, there's a school of thought here that says, as the impacts are understood in your own countries, that might start to influence what, what governments do and, and what should be happening. And a final question, Strand, there. Uh, Alex, first um, I think it was here I raised the issue with an uh, EU commissioner sometime about the one of the freedom of movement of people is actually freedom of movement of labour. And if that freedom of movement was con constructed in terms of simply movement of labor, maybe that would be a deal breaker. 
or a deal facilitator. Yeah. I think we've got enough deal breakers on the table at the moment that we probably don't need any more. So what about Robin's point here about, uh, about what do you expect to happen, happen next um, after that and how you know, will the white paper at least open up? Because, of course, as Tony's just reminded us, um, we do have to sort of get, get those um, white bits of the withdrawal agreement turning greener. Mm -hmm. if we're going to move on to, on to phase two. But what, what do people envisage happening next after this is published? What's, uh, any idea of the sort of preparations and what's the next well, staging? Well, I mean, the, the, strictly speaking, the, if the white paper is out next Thursday, which is, is one date that I've heard, then the, the next formal response from the EU would be the General Affairs Council on the 20th of July. So that would really give them just... Uh, I think five working days to assess um, a 150-page uh, document. Might um, be shorter by then. Uh, <laughs> we, w one would hope. Um, <laughs> As the square brackets are deleted, but anyway, yeah. as choices are made. Um, and again, the, the, the customs paper is really about the future relationship. Yeah. Uh, it's oh, a yeah. wider, bigger yeah. sort of vision of things, whereas there are the awful outstanding issues on the yeah. withdrawal agreement, principally the Irish backstop. Uh, so, so that is really where it's going to be at. I mean, obviously, the British government see the Irish border in, in, in terms of its future relationship. It, it would prefer yeah. that the backstop went away and that, and that the future uh, customs arrangements or, or relationship in general would obviate the need uh, for a, a, a backstop. Mm. The Irish government, and by extension, the European Union, say that the backstop must be in there, it must be legally operable in the withdrawal agreements. Now, I think what's going to happen is that what's in the, like where Theresa May finally lands and where she can bring her cabinet to land mm -hmm. will change the mood music uh, as we get in towards October. And at that point, I think um, the language that is in the Irish protocol that, that first appeared in, in the draft withdrawal agreement back in February. Mm -hmm. This is the language that Theresa May said no British government could ever accept. I think there will be, there, there'll be room to change the language, but not the fundamentals. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think all of these things will hang together. But I, I do detect as well reluctance at EU level to let the Irish issue just kind of be isolated at the very end. Uh, and, and that they, they will try to make sure that you know, if, if it looks like Britain is trying to isolate the mm. Irish issue to the last minute, that they will they will not let that happen in terms of holding up the negotiations. So, Sonia, you're sitting around in Brussels. Is there a draft of the political agreement on the future framework that's already starting to circulate? Because that, after all, is what we're expecting in October, if the October European Council is the decision-making on the withdrawal agreement, that they also sign off that 20 to 30 page document you know, perhaps quite detailed. We heard that Mrs. Merkel was keen for it to be quite detailed. David Davis is apparently keen for it to be very detailed. Mm -hmm. Others think it would be hugely helpful to the Prime Minister if it was incredibly vague and just used every synonym for special going. Um, so is there a do document around? Because um, that's what we'd expect in the next sort of phase, isn't it? it with you? It's, yeah. it's here Where is it? You've left it on a Eurostar. I've left it on a Eurostar, exactly. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> somebody, somebody, in Doncaster is, somebody in Doncaster is going to find it. And, uh, sent um, I mean, I, I think the honest answer is, is, is I, I really don't know, but the idea was that um, the, the backstop would have had sufficient or significant progress in the June Council, and then the EU could then get into working on the political declaration. But of course, uh, that hasn't happened, so that's being held up. I mean, I, I suspect once they see the white paper, then they, they, they can start looking at the de declaration. But the EU would prefer the declaration to be fairly vague, uh, minimalist, and also that it, it will be made clear that the, the political declaration is just that. It's, it's a declaration that's not legally binding and that, and that it would be obviously open to, to change. So, Chris, is that because we heard that uh, the March Council, I think, that Angela Merkel said, you know, a bit of fluffy diplomatese isn't enough. It needs to have more detail in it. Is that still the understanding in Germany, or is she so otherwise preoccupied that uh, that she won't be focusing on uh, on what the document, what the future framework document might say? 
Well, I, I do think that uh, in Germany we take Brexit very seriously and every, it would be neglected not to look at any document coming uh, from the UK in this regard. But as I said, it's, it's, uh, Brexit ne is negotiated in Brussels. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm quite sure that they will have a very close look at it. And of course, as Germans, we always want to have like pretty strict and clear, uh, detailed um, ideas of what's going on. And, and I think the British fluffiness sometimes <coughs> makes uh, that a little bit difficult, of course. Um, so, no, I think um, the white paper, it always depends on what is in it. Uh, we have seen so many announcements of papers or mm, important mm. documents and whatever mm. coming out and in the end they didn't or they've been postponed or blackened mm. or... So it, it depends on what is uh, in the document, how clear and uh, unambiguous it is um, if it changes the negotiations. So, uh, do you get any sense? On, do you get any sort of Jacob? Do you get any sense of how your governments are preparing to feed into phase two of the negotiation? I mean, are they working out? We've seen, you know, for example, I think this is relevant. I'm not sure. It's particularly big for the Greeks. She says, looking at uh, whatever um, things like feta cheese that still not agreed on things like geographical indications like this you know seriously nerdy and stuff like that that matters a lot to the Italians it doesn't it? and actually this is where uh, I think uh, the, the Italians not just the Italians they hope that the final outcome is a close alignment of Britain to uh, European market rules so mm. membership of the different mm. agencies mm. in order not to disrupt the general regulatory framework because, for instance, the Italians are very worried about the Parmigiano mm. and the mozzarella mm. di bufala and all these things that could be, you know, copied yeah. uh, outside the European mm. framework. So, yes, I mean, this is why probably if um, at the end of the white paper of, uh, there is a sense that uh, Britain is moving towards uh, the so-called soft mm. Brexit option, mm. this will help to speed up the negotiation because this is clearly the preferred outcome for the Europeans for many reasons. Okay, how about the audiences? What's the reaction, you know, the question we had about, you know, is this resonating domestically? You know, some countries, obviously, Monsieur Macron has to look over, yeah. over the fence at the Front National or whatever it's... I think, I mean... We, we report on Brexit, there yeah. is no doubt about it. And when we report about it, we have quite a lot of reactions from readers. Mm. It, there is lots of interest. Mm. It's clearly much mm. read. And, but the feeling we get back when we go back is usually what's going on. Because, because it is so complex mm. and they, it's very mm. difficult on our side, mm. which means maybe we don't do our job properly because they still don't understand. Mm. But for mm. us, <laughs> even that here, it's sometimes quite tricky to, to manage to explain what's going on and uh, how, where it's going. And there is that feeling that uh, nothing is happening, basically, and nothing has happened for the last two years apart from a bit nothing of fluffiness and uh, nothing has changed. So there is a question I had, I was this mm. weekend in Paris and um, with quite a large gathering of people and the question was, but it's not happening that Brexit, is it ever happening? I said, no, yes, officially it's happening extremely soon actually. But you know, so I think there is an interest, mm. but there is as well that feeling that it's not happening in, the negotiations are not really mm. happening. It's still happening here. And, and the, the question about how the negotiations mm. are going to um, go from, from the white paper, of course it depends on what is in. And I think the hope is that Theresa May will come with something where the European Commission can say maybe and not no. And from then on they can begin maybe to discuss properly on the basis where you can finally get to an agreement which would be what Tony said, the closest... Uh, but if we look at Germany, where the AFD is now the official opposition, is there sort of any looking over among sort of mainstream politicians to say, actually, we don't like Brexit, that's the wrong solution, but actually maybe we do need to rethink a bit about, you know, the relationship between Europe and citizens and look at some of the debates we're having, well, having here? There, there is quite a lot uh, of debate going on right now in, in Berlin and in the whole of Germany, um, especially uh, with regard to the mm. migrations. 
But um, Brexit doesn't really play a role in this kind of discussion. And uh, uh, especially we had the latest survey coming out saying that the uh, Germans feel very much committed to the EU and even mm. stronger than uh, in the last survey. So. No, there is no real reaction to that. And, but and again, yeah. the, the appetite mm. for leaving the mm. EU is not there, including mm. in the far-right parties. In France, the Front, Front National mm. has left, com has abandoned completely that Brexit idea. It's not uh, an issue. It's not a, uh, a discussion right now. Okay. Let's, if I, if yeah. I can uh, add just a point, I mean, of course, it is well known that the German industry and car mm. makers are very. Uh, very uh, engaged mm. in, in the UK and have a big interest to keep the rules, regulations and customs as mm. they are. And I think we've seen in the last days how, how concerned they are. So there is a, a big debate going on underneath um, of mm. the, the, um, the industry bodies. They're trying to inform their people, they're trying to inform the companies. The companies are trying mm. to prepare and trying to find how uh, the, the contingency plans. The thing is, they don't really know what to prepare for, and that's mm. what they all say. And if, if uh, you have a close look at what BMW said, mm. it's not they are not going to tear down their, their plants mm. in the UK, but they have to reconsider mm. how to invest in the future mm. years. And, and this is very much um, part of thinking right now in Germany as well. Uh, as uh, it is here, I think. Yeah, so in Poland, in terms of audiences, no massive interest at the moment yet, but there's a question of EU citizens. Obviously, with a million of Poles in the UK, that's an important one, particularly given that you have elections in Poland next year, parliamentary presidential 2020. So if anything goes wrong with EU citizens, that will be an extremely political topic. Uh, the, the, the current government would be blamed for that uh, if anything goes wrong. And that, that reminds me of last week's briefing we had about settled status when we asked what happens if there's no deal, what happens to the settled status proposal. No one seems to know the answer to that. And definitely the Polish government will be worried about that and political impact of that on it. But and if there was a sense that there was no deal because EU stuck out and that has denied the settled status offer to EU citizens of the UK, would that have any negative fallout or would it all be the UK's fault? I mean, would, you know, in the blame game or the Wimbledon that uh, Tony was talking about? I guess that, that would be, be seen as the UK's fault. Yeah. I, I guess okay. it would not be seen as... And, and remember, I mean, there's a second side to the Brexit issue mm -hmm. as well with the Article 7 proceedings mm -hmm. against Poland. Obviously, mm -hmm. Poland very much sort of expects UK to vote with it on the Article 7 proceedings, or at least to abstain, not to vote in favour of it. And definitely, the, the way UK votes on that will affect the way Poland behaves towards the UK mm -hmm. in, the, in the negotiations in the autumn. So, and if, if the UK if abstains or votes with Poland, how will that go down? That will not help for, <laughs> for okay. the atmosphere, the overall atmosphere, let's say. Uh -huh. Maybe we'll just have to have a football match to watch or something, so we no, just that's don't. that's a bad idea, I'm afraid. No? no. Anyway, <laughs> it is the one area where we can be smug at the moment with European <laughs> panels, which is very strange. Well, anyway, um, this point about would it make a difference if it was freedom of movement of labour, which I think actually technically it is, it's isn't it? Yeah. Freedom of movement. I mean, there's always been this line that the UK has had a particular problem with freedom of movement because we haven't bothered to use the enforcement mechanisms that we, yeah. we could yeah. have done. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> I mean, so. you know, when you think about it, the, for example, the Polish population in the UK, 93% is in education at work, mm. in work. So you don't have millions of unemployed mm. Polish people in the UK. You just don't have that. So if you're trying to make the, the, the distinction between you know, EU migrants coming here doing nothing, that's just... And the, the, the fundamental problem with that is mm. there's a wonderful Ipsos Mori research published every year called The Perils of Perception. Mm. And the UK consistently has the worst uh, results across Europe in terms of how, how, for example, how many people you think are EU migrants living in the UK? Consistently, UK population thinks it's double the amount, the real amount uh, of, of EU nationals. How many of them you think are unemployed? Consistently, double the real figure. Mm. So there's a problem of perception there, much more than the real situation on the ground. Just quickly, you raised really settled status. Do Settled status, I mean, more of an issue, no, Italy, Italy, yes. whatever. Do people, do people think, yes, that Home Office idea, that's looking okay now, we're pretty happy with that, uh, as long as they go away, or are they looking, it's the Home Office, you know, is this going to really go like that, stuff like that, is, no, it, is what, it good? What I saw, what I heard from the um, 
Europeans, Italians living here, they were um, quite, I don't want to say skeptical, but very cautious their reaction towards it. I mean, they, they really want to see how it is practically implemented and what has not helped is the Windrush scandal. Mm -hmm. I mean, they really fear that, you know, with all the good intentions, but there could be some cock up at the end and hundreds of thousands of European citizens mm -hmm. end up in a sort of legal limbo where, you know, they are not 100% sure mm -hmm. of their situation and one day they or their children mm -hmm. could risk to find themselves in the same situation of the Windrush generation. That scandal has really played a big part in the, how to say, um, imagination of the, 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 the perception of the Europeans. Yeah, and percent it can go horribly wrong. I mean, yeah. that, that's clear. I mean, yeah, you'll have Home Office itself, they say, we don't know how many EU citizens mm -hmm. are in this country, it may be 3.3, mm -hmm. it may be 3.5, it may be 4 million, we don't know, no one knows. Uh, so it will be a lot of applications to, process, to be processed in a short period of time. I think the frustration in the population I know best, the Polish population mm. in the UK, is that it's been two years since the referendum. The system is nowhere mm. to be seen. No one knows when it's going to be, to be launched. Now we hear about the autumn or, or, or early next year. How is that going to work? The system is not ready. We haven't seen it at work. Why is that taking so much time? I think a lot of people there have so growing mistrust mm. of the Home Office, not because they hate Home Office, I think they, most of them barely know what it is. Mm. It's more about this thing not being mm. operational yet. It's yes. like they just want to get over it. They want to apply, get something, and this just and, and continue their life. But also annoyed yeah. by the principle of having to pay the £65, yeah. pounds because they say, mm. these are our mm. rights that we already have and enjoy. Why should, you, should we pay for having them enshrined in, uh, you know, in, in they have a right to okay. you know, I mean, No, no, this, I mean, it's not a big amount of yeah. money, but, you know, it was felt as a, you know... A OK, let's take a final couple of questions. Uh, let's try and get everybody in a rapid fire way. So, if Lewis goes there and then Adela come here, start off and then we'll go back there. Yeah, so, final stop. So, I'll start. I start. Uh, thank you. Uh, Vicky Price, ex-civil servant. Um, so the question is really about the transition period, we just touched on that and how quickly various things can happen and be implemented. Uh, but of course the likelihood is that we, we will end up in October with an agreement of sorts, which is as vague as been just discussed, yeah. with a lot of the details uh, actually so being sorted out during the transition period. So businesses still yeah. won't know exactly what will happen, yeah. except a vague idea of where we might be So quickly, quick, quickish question, uh, so I can get everything yeah. in. Yeah, so, so the question is, where, where will, the, will the, the various governments keep the interest going, uh, and will they be happy to have an extension of the transition period? Okay, yes. There, Adela. There, gentleman. There. Yes, uh, I'd like to ask, uh, what talk in your various countries has there been about British citizens in your respective countries and their status after Britain leaves the EU? Okay, great question. Yes, and nicely short. Four words, journalist. Um, if the government is moving, as it seems, as far as possible to a Brexit in name only, will the EU then be the ones insisting that Brexit means Brexit? Okay, that, that might be more of a headline than a whatever. And finally, down here. <coughs> David Hanning, House of Lords. Uh, to what extent is the possibility that any deal is rejected by the British Parliament being taken into account in your capitals? Uh, and if so, what sort of contingency planning are they doing and how to respond? Okay, well, that's a very, very sort of comprehensive uh, set of final questions. So let's, let's bounce through those. Um, transition, I mean, of course, the EU has already said it can't get into detailed negotiations with the UK on the future relationship until the UK becomes a third country and the UK doesn't become a third country until the 30th of March 2019 or, you know, European time at least. Um, so, you know, is the transition nearly long enough? There's this sort of interesting point about the withdrawal agreement doesn't make any provision for extension of the transition. That could be necessary that Jean-Claude Piris is always going on about that if you want to extend, you need to have it in there, otherwise it's too late. So what's the thinking about the feasibility of including uh, concluding some sort of arrangement and then getting it ratified in that quite short transition. Well, I think that's the point of the political declaration is that you set out your 
your, your, the, the principal areas that will govern the future relationship. Yeah. Uh, so it'll be um, the trade relationship, the security yeah. relationship, uh, the data protection, the science, education, research, all of those different pillars. Um, so that once the uh, clock ticks past uh, March 30th, then you can start the, those trade negotiations and, and you will have all the fields already there. Um. So Liam Fox said it was going to be the easiest trade deal ever, I yeah. think, last year. But the EU has repeated, I mean, the EU takes quite a long time to do trade agreements. We have a table in our excellent preparing Brexit report of how long it takes the EU. It's well, it never done a trade deal, anything like that quickly. It depends on which end of the spectrum we end up. If it's, uh, if it's a Canada, that's one end of the spectrum where it's a full free trade negotiation, which but that's could what take years. Is, that's what the EU is expecting on the basis of the UK red lines, isn't it? Or is it not? Well, really? it, well the, 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 that's, that's the crunch, really, is if, if, the, yeah. if the UK dissolves or blurs their red lines, then we will shift over towards the Norway yeah. end of the yeah. spectrum. And I mean, I, I've spoken to senior people in, mm -hmm. in uh, Brussels about this, and they, they reckon that it's either Canada plus backstop for Northern Ireland, or it's Norway plus uh, customs union. And okay, plus agriculture. Plus agriculture. Um, and if, if you end up at that end of the spectrum, then if, you, if you're complying with the EU single market uh, on goods and agriculture and all the regulatory alignment and standards and so on, then the free trade agreement uh, is going to be fairly quick. Um, oh. I mean, it'll be, it'll be like Norway. No, Liam, I'm not, I'm Liam not suggesting. Fox right, we I, hear first from Tony Connolly. I, I'm not suggesting that, that Theresa May will, will <laughs> plump for that tomorrow uh, or even in two or three months' time. but. You know, if, if they want to solve the backstop, it's, it's a question of whether Theresa May decides to save the union or, or, to, or to the union of Great Britain and Northern Ireland or whether she goes for Global Britain. And uh, my instinct is that she will um, want to save the union of Great Britain and Northern Ireland first. Okay. And if, if somebody said in October or November, as a special council in December, we actually really need a bit longer for transition and actually put a clause into that withdrawal agreement. Would anyone's government have a problem with that? Um, I, I think the Germans are quite sympathetic to the needs of the UK, but having said that, I mean, in the end, uh, I think from the business side, we had the very big relief of the companies mm. saying, like, getting a transition deal to prepare. Mm. But um, in the last weeks and months, uh, the mood has shifted a little mm. bit because um, in the end, uh, the no deal makes a transition agreement, uh, overthrows okay. it. So it, it's not going to happen. And since they still don't know what is happening after the transition deal, I mean, many companies, especially German Mittelstand, I know that's maybe a cliche, but they always think not only in two or three years' time periods, they think in long term. And uh, extending the transition period is uh, maybe quite nice, but in one day you have to make a decision. And if uh, a company owner has to make a decision mm. now to invest or not, he can maybe push it forward a couple of months or a couple of yeah. maybe even years. But in, in the end, you have to make a decision. So I don't think it, the extension mm. of the transition period or implementation period doesn't really help that much. Okay. So um, I, I wouldn't rule it out that Germans uh, would oppose it, but oh. um, I don't see, um, I mean, in the end we have the elections coming up in, in the EU as well, so it, it causes many, many problems as well. So it's and I don't think there is an ap any appetite for an ongoing Brexit for yeah. the next 20 years, basically. <laughs> okay. So there might be scope for a little extension, but clearly not, uh, it would have to be very strictly limited, because I don't think there is appetite okay. for negotiation and those crunch Brexit checkers no. Never Brexit. day away. Yeah. There would be um, room for an extension mm. if there was really some practical technical yeah. issues yeah. like for example the consent of parliament if that yeah. uh, happens to, to mm. be difficult or due mm. to technical issues yeah. that might be a point but just for more negotiations, more mm. white papers or something more like that. More procrastination. So, Sonia, there are 157,000 British citizens in France, we think, in our very excellent views of the 27, uh, which I think makes you the next biggest after Spain. Uh, do you care about all these Brits there? Are you doing anything of for them? Yeah, we, we have settled status. Do you have estatus settled or whatever? Best friends, what are you, I mean. 
And what are you doing for, uh, for Brits, in Spain, Brits in France? Well, uh, I think they're quite worried and I think uh, the problem is they, uh, they I think, and I, I know because we know from our embassies, mm. there have been quite a lot of um, application for mm. French citizenship, uh, which have been, I mean, it's gone through the roof. Mm. Germany is the most mm. Uh, mm. concerned by those um, applications. Um, so, so that's one option, basically. But and, I think and do you get the, do you get the sense the British government is doing very much on behalf of British citizens in France to impress well, on? I uh, think they don't get that feeling. But I, you would have to ask them. But I do remember very clearly we had here a meeting with uh, the Home Office uh, to explain to the French citizens, and they've done that. I think with nearly. Uh, uh, or at least the biggest population of mm. EU citizens to explain to us what would be the settled statue and everything. And they tried to do the same in the British Embassy uh, in Paris with British citizens living in France. And it was a big, big nightmare because the, the mm. ambassador was shouted out because they were very pleased about the way um, they felt British citizens were taken care by their own, mm. by, by the British government. Uh, so you would have to invite a panel of British citizens from uh, OK, well, that's another potential future event. What about David Hannay's point about, you know, we've obviously been watching uh, the EU Withdrawal Now Act going through, the debates about meaningful vote, the chance that the British Parliament would reject a deal, or indeed, I suppose the European Parliament might rather less likely uh, reject a deal. So, you know, any contingency, pla contingency planning against that, or contingency planning for no I deal in any of your? Not that I'm aware of. No, and I think no. the expectation on the European side is that the vote will go through. Yeah. Yeah. In yeah. the European Parliament, yes. In, in the, the British, British Parliament, Parliament, that's another question, <laughs> yeah. and that's a question for the British. And did you try and explain meaningful vote to? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the French for meaningful? No, actually, uh, I... A vote um, qui a du sens. <laughs> <laughs> sounds Which like a sensible vote. Anyway, yeah. I think, I, think, uh, I think Theresa May is um, worried about losing the vote um, mm. because you, you would assume that uh, Labour will vote against the deal because Jeremy Corbyn is getting more pressure from, yeah. from Unite and, and from uh, Momentum. Um, and then if you had sufficient number of... Uh, Tory remainers uh, who don't like it as well, you could you could have a defeat. Um, what would that mean then? Like, does that mean the, the the EU would have to come back to the negotiating table? That that's that would be a tough one. Um, but if if it was felt that there were a few more elements that could get things over the line, then uh, I think the EU would have to look at that. And that's the way you see it going: that the Tory remainers will revolt. I think some, some of us think some, Tory Remainers them, at the end of the day never revolt and actually yeah, sorry, the people I, I, like I, I to mean, revolt to the Tory I, I, sorry, Brexiteers. I, I, I beg your pardon, I mean, I mean the Brexiteers <laughs> oh, right. and, and the Labour okay. would, would uh, vote against it. I think, that, I think that's yeah. a more plausible, yes. uh, plausible yeah. scenario. Yeah. So what's the no deal planning that Ireland's doing? Is it doing a lot? One thing that they're very worried about at the moment is um, the land bridge because 80% of goods that go to mm. the European mainland go mm. through the UK. Mm. Uh, so what happens uh, when the UK is a third country. So you'll yeah. have goods going yeah. from one EU member state to another, but through a third country. Yeah. Uh, and uh, one phrase I've heard is that I I Irish truck drivers should get uh, priority boarding at uh, Dover. Uh, and I can see how that will go down mm -hmm. with uh, British truckers if uh, these uh, trucks with Irish flags can mm. come sailing past uh, <laughs> into the priority queue. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, you would have to have the same facilities mm -hmm. in uh, Calais because mm -hmm. you would have to separate out British trucks and Irish trucks. Uh, and that is a, a real problem. Um, the British government have said in principle that they're going to join the common transit area, which will make a mm -hmm. lot of that uh, a bit more uh, frictionless, if I can use that word. Um, but they have to do a lot of bilateral talks with the French and with the Belgians and with the Dutch as to how this is going to be managed. And of course, the EU will have to deal with this as well. But it's a, it's a major worry. Mm. Yeah. So let's talk, take Paul's point as the final, final point. If the Prime Minister, this may or may not be her attention, but if we end up with something that the UK government has to, you know, basically is as near as possible to staying in a... Uh, single market, whatever, customs union style relationship with the EU, uh, 
but obviously the Prime Minister probably still needs to dress it up as it's different, things have changed. Will it be the EU that finally says, no, you wanted Brexit, this isn't Brexit? Is it your point, Paul, that it wouldn't be brexit enough? It would be well, Michel uh, Barnier who says, no, that's not real. It wouldn't hurt enough. It wouldn't hurt enough. Uh, no, that, well, that's, I I think mean, too many cherries. Uh, it's I a think. myth, that thing about punishment of the UK. We, we, that there haven't been any, I mean, it's, it's really a myth. It is in no one interest for Britain to leave the European Union. I mean, we've said it mm. several times during that panel, and you've, we've said it and we've heard it. It's, it's hurting everyone. So it is, there is in no way uh, any feeling that we need to punish. But there is a point where when the UK has decided to leave and then wants to mm. bend all the mm -hmm. rules and to have the whole of the mm. European Union change its own function or, or the way that it functions just to adjust to the new mm. situation of the UK where you, you have obviously some, uh, some, mm. some restriction and some, uh, you know, but the punishment, I find it, uh, it, it's a real myth. I mean, there is no real uh, well, appetite I, for I that. I think the biggest mm. punishment for the United Kingdom would be to be reduced to a vassal state. And this is probably the preferred outcome for, for Europe, to have the British out of the decision room, because they're annoying, but still, <laughs> sub but still subjected to all the European laws and regulations. Not everybody so, thinks we're annoying, actually. Luigi. No, well, I mean, no, the Italians no, were perhaps annoying, but joking, I, think yeah. some, I think we have some people who rather regret the, uh, regret the loss of the British voice. No, so no, would we, so, including the, yeah. especially, the especially the Irish. So would we become founder members of Monsieur Macron's outer circle? In this sort of Brino. Well, but that for that you would need to stay in the European Union. Oh, okay. You so know, the, the sort of way of bringing more that people the, in. The new and Europe with several right. speed that he's advocating means you still stay in the European oh, Union. Right. You're still member of the club. You just pay different membership. But if you're out of the club, it's completely different. So, you know. Anyway, I think we're going to have to call it a halt there. We'll all be reading with deep fascination what you all end up writing about uh, about checkers hopefully we will have some cabinet decisions and hopefully we will have a white paper uh, even if not translated into lots of languages now we've realized we can save on that it's very good news to you know you can all read english they're just trying to get past all of you and send it straight to you domestic things checkers meeting tomorrow <laughs> am i optimistic i don't know i think there are people here much better better qualified. Uh, if they aren't going to deliver a result in checkers and white paper next week, this is the worst ever exercise in expectations management by a British government. Uh, she could say, you can use that one as a quote. Uh, anyway, so I would hope so for everybody's sake. Uh, so thank you all very much for coming. Uh, just if uh, dealing with uh, uh, the EU27 isn't enough, next week we have the next of our, uh, our uh, hashtag IFG Brexit events on Thursday when we have Matthew Rycroft, the Permanent Secretary at the Department for International Development, looking at how the UK might uh, look at aid and development after Brexit with a very interesting panel. That's an area where we at the moment put, uh, put some of our uh, ever-increasing aid budget through EU frameworks. We promised deep cooperation going forward. What might that look like, etc. So do come along to that. You can find registration on our website. But meanwhile, thank you all very much for taking time out in such a busy week to come and listen to our very excellent panel. So if we could just thank them.